Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There is a word that has great significance for the last days, and this word is apostasy. And what apostasy is from a biblical perspective is turning away from that which is true, that which is good, from God's perspective. And we know that the Apostle Paul tells us that as we approach the last days, that's exactly what's going to happen among many congregations. They are going to move away from right doctrine, that which is sound according to the revelation of God. We're going to begin a three-part study in the epistle to Titus. Paul wrote this epistle to Titus, and one of the purposes for it was for Titus to set things in order, God's order. And it's for this reason that this epistle has great relevance for you and me. We're called to be an influence in this world. Let me say it a different way. We are called to have a testimony. And through a God-pleasing testimony, we will influence others. We will bring change. And in order to do that, we have to be willing to speak out, to step up and to say what truly needs to be said it. So take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Titus, the epistle that Paul wrote to Titus and chapter 1. Now, in this study, these three parts, we're going to go through each chapter, each verse, and pay close attention to every word. We want to see literally what this epistle says in order that we can understand it and apply it to our life, in order that we can have influence, that we can bring change. First and foremost, that we would change. And then secondly, we would change others around us, that we would draw closer to the purposes, the will of the living God. Notice how Paul begins. The first thing that he says is, Paul a servant. Now, some will say a bondservant of God. This same word can be translated as a slave, but not a slave in the sense that one is taken by force and, and demanded to do certain things. And if he doesn't, then he will be punished. One of the reasons why many translations in English translate this word a bondservant is because it has to do with an individual who has submitted. And in essence, every God-fearing person should be a servant, a slave, a bondservant unto the Lord. In the Torah, we know that Moses is called repeatedly the servant of God. And this is why when we look at this first verse as it continues, there's something that stands out. And probably most English translations never make mention of this. Now, as I said, we're going to study this book. It is not for the purpose of giving some uh, message, some call to action, something that, that interests individuals to, to do something, but rather we're going to take this approach. We're going to study this, learn it, and then trust that the Holy Spirit will use it for the purposes of God. 
And the more we understand what this epistle truly says, the better able we will be to apply it, demonstrate it, and bear fruit that is pleasing to God. And the first thing I want to point out as we look at this first verse and continue on, there is a conjunction. Now, we know a conjunction takes one thought and it unites it with another. And in the New Covenant Greek, there are two primary conjunctions. One is chi, normally it's translated and. And its primary purpose, although there's others, but its primary purpose is to simply unite two things. Then there's another conjunction, day. And this is a conjunction of disunity, meaning that it unites two things, but that second thing usually has a different purpose. It might be in contrast to, it manifests something that is not a continuation, but it can be something that is different. And this is why we see here in verse 1 that it says, Paul, a bondservant of God, and most will say, and, but there's a difference here. Paul is saying not only is he, like many others, a servant of God, that he has submitted to the things of God, but there's an additional aspect, something that's unique, something that is different. And what is that? That Paul is not only a servant, but he also has the call of an apostle. And this is what he wants to emphasize. So this second conjunction is being used for the purpose of emphasizing his apostleship. So Paul, yes, he's a bondservant of God, but also he is an apostle of Yeshua HaMashiach, that is Messiah Yeshua, according to, and notice this next word, faith. And then there's a description of this faith, this faith of the elect of God. Now, in actuality, the definite article is not here, but it's very hard to translate it without the definite article. And the reason why the definite article does not appear in Greek here is to say that this is not a unique experience. This just isn't for him, but this faith, the faith of the elect of God, all people, it is something that everyone is being invited to. Later on, when, when Paul uses this same word for faith, he uses an adjective. This is the word for common. And what it means is it is available. It is the faith that, that all humans must respond to. But notice there's something else. He's talking about the elect of God. And this word elect, although many times people will bring a lot of theological significance to this word elect. But what it literally means is simply to be chosen. And notice that faith is mentioned first in the Greek text. It's the ones who, according, and he's making it personal about Paul, who is an apostle of Messiah Yeshua, according to faith, the faith of the elect of God, and, and now we have that normal conjunction, that word chi. It's uniting something. It's giving us a very important truth. And that is, it's speaking about the connection between faith, and notice what he says, the knowledge of the truth. So, knowledge of the truth. In the text, we see a relationship between faith and truth. And that's why I say so frequently, faith is just not believing something. Biblical faith is when you believe the truth of God. When you have knowledge of God's true revelation. And secondly, when we look at this same passage again, 
we see that this, this truth, when we respond to it, when we apply it to our life, that's what faith is. It brings about us becoming the elect of God, chosen by God. And then finally it says, cut. And this is a word for according to. But the purpose here is to show a result. Sometimes that word kata, and if you're looking at it, and many people do through different aids and such, they'll say, well, wait, it's not the word kata, it's the word kat. But the last letter, alpha, was removed. Why? Because the next word begins with a vowel, a Greek vowel, and when that happens, we remove the last vowel of this this word kata. And what it speaks about is a result. So we see Paul saying that he, he has received a call because of faith. That God has chosen him through this faith and this faith comes by knowledge. And that's the key. Faith comes by knowledge of the truth. And when we take truth and faith and put it together, what's the outcome? Well, look at the end of verse 1. The outcome is godliness. And this word has to do with a behavior. What Paul is revealing is this. Faith, true faith, rooted in the truth of God. When you know God's truth and apply it to your life, there's going to be an outcome. It's going to produce godliness. And there's a relationship between this word godliness in practice and the manifestation of God's glory. So look at this verse again. Verse 1, Paul says that he is a bondservant of God, but an apostle of Messiah Yeshua, according to faith, the faith of the elect of God and the knowledge of the truth which produces that bears out godliness that's what he's saying here look now to verse 2 when we have faith and that is when we respond to the truth of god when we see godliness being demonstrated in our life you know what we we then have we have a proper expectation Now, expectations need to be rooted. And when we look at this text, we're going to see the next word is the the Greek preposition epi. And here, once more, if you look at it, you see the same rule. The, The iota fell off. It was removed because the next word here, el pis has to do with the, the, what begins with a vowel as well, and therefore it falls off it's ep now the reason why i'm going into detail which many of you may not find necessary or interesting is i want to demonstrate something this word epi usually means upon founded upon and what he's saying here is something that we learn from the patriarchs the reason why the patriarchs were faithful individuals why they, when they heard and had knowledge of the truth of God, they took that truth, those promises that God manifested to them. They acted, that is, they received them with faith, and that faith produced an outcome, a godliness. But what was their motivation? Their motivation was just what we talked about, God's promises. They had hope. But their hope did not originate in what they wanted, but it originated with what the truth of God revealed to to them, and that is the promises of God. So we see here that all of this was founded upon, it was established by hope. And what was that hope? Notice how the next phrase ends. We're speaking about eternal life. Now, does that just mean that they didn't want to die? It was because God says, if you respond and enter into this covenant, this Abrahamic covenant, you will live forever and ever and ever. Well, that may be part of it, but what we see 
is this phrase for eternal life should rightly be understood because the word eternal here is an adjective that describes the kingdom of God. So they had a hope, and that hope was the kingdom life. They wanted to live according to kingdom principles. They wanted to manifest the character of the kingdom in their life. This is foundational. And it's only when we have that desire, then and only then, and this is an important takeaway, then and only then can we have an expectation that we are going to be recipients eternally of the promises of God. Now, here's a question that many people need to ask themselves. See, we're speaking about something that has end times relevance. And God's purpose for the end times, it's a transition away from this world, from the ways of this world, into the kingdom of God. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, am I interested in that kingdom? Do I desire the character of that kingdom to experience that? to take hold of it, to be part of it, and am I interested in kingdom promises? Here's the problem. I see many people teaching, and they're using the Word of God inappropriately. They are perverting the Word of God to get individuals to believe that through scriptural principles, which have been twisted, that you can achieve worldly ambitions you cannot do not come to faith do not think that being a believer in messiah Yeshua is going to assist you in accomplishing your worldly desires those worldly desires need to be nailed to the cross we have kingdom desires what motivates us are the kingdom promises of god and that's what he's talking here saying about this faith this this desire that we have which is based upon and hope of of kingdom life and then we continue on in verse 2 it says god who promised now notice how god is defined here it is a word, it's a adjective in this case, for a liar. It describes one who is false. And what the Greek language does, it takes one letter, the alpha, puts it in front of as a preposition to a word, and it negates it. It causes it to be the opposite. So we are a follower of a God that is not false many translations and this is fine say a god who and they'll make it a verbal form cannot lie and he cannot lie now let me tell you what a foolish person does they'll say well is is everything possible for god and most people say yes he's omnipotent he is all powerful he can do anything can he lie Ah, he can't lie, the scripture says, and they think that they have a conflict. That's ridiculous. See, the Bible says God, although all things are possible, he's never going to do anything against his character. If he did, he would not be this holy God. So it's not that he's unable, he chooses not to, because it is against his character. And in the same way that he's committed to his character, and by the way, his character is the kingdom character. So if we love God, we're going to be motivated by his character. We're going to want to be like him. And that's going to draw us into the kingdom, meaning having a kingdom perspective, a kingdom desire, being committed to the kingdom purposes. So God's made a promise this God who does not lie who is not false and he made it when before the times of old and this is that same word for eternal he made it prior to the the ancient of days meaning he made it before and how we might be able to understand it is before the foundations of the world 
Now, one of the things that comes into my mind when I hear the foundations of the world before that, I think about the lamb who has been slain. And in essence, what we're talking about when we talk about faith and covenant promises and a hope that will not disappoint and a kingdom reality, all of those things are, are related to who? Messiah. And the reason why that they are available is because he is the Lamb of God who was slain. When it says slain before the foundations of the earth, meaning God had that as his purpose for his son. Doesn't mean that he was literally slain before the foundations of the world. He was slain 2,000 years ago. But before this world began and eternity passed, God knew all things, and he knew that, that his son was going to lay down his life in order for a kingdom reality to be offered to who? To all humanity. Now, does that mean God has to offer to all humanity? No, but that's his desire. And we know before, and we see this in Matthew 24, verse 14, before God's wrath will, will be poured out, there's going to be that everlasting gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, is going to be proclaimed to all the nations of the earth. Let's go back to verse 2. Speaking about this God who cannot lie, he has promised from before the, the ancient times. And now, notice what it says, look at verse 3. But... And this is the same word of, of a, a contrast. What's being contrast? And why is it being likened? Because previously, he was speaking about a promise. A promise that was made a long time ago. And now, we're no longer talking about simply the promise of what God was going to do. Now, we're speaking about, this is the different part, the manifestation of that promise look again verse 3 but he manifested in its own time meaning at the proper time his word in many bibles will say preaching but it's a word for proclamation and this is a word for a proclamation of significance it is something that is said that is important and going to have a outcome some type of outcome but it's going to be a significant one for who for all humanity so god made this promise before the foundations of the earth but now it says in its own time he has manifested his word in proclamation which he says I was entrusted. It was entrusted to me according to, and this is important, commandment. According to the, the commandment. And there's two things that needs to be said here. So significant that the word commandment comes into play. And what does commandment have to do with? Well, commandment is a a proclamation that demands a response so he's talked about a significant proclamation and now he's saying by commandment that is it demands a response a specific response and then as we move forward notice it says commandment of god our savior now the question is who are we referring to when it says a commandment of God our Savior? Is it referring to God the Father or Messiah here? Now, when we just look at it here, there's no way we can be dogmatic. We really can't answer the question. There are two possibilities, but we cannot come to a, a conclusive answer. Is it God the Father or God the Son? But when we keep reading, we can come. And this is what we mean when we say Scripture interprets Scripture. Look on to, to verse, 
verse 4. Now he speaks about uh, Titus, Hebrew Titus. Titus. And then he uses a term for a child. A child that is a, a production of a marriage. Now, even though Titus was not a biological child of Paul, what Paul was saying is, by this promise, they have become a family. And he's emphasizing this relationship as a father-son. This one who is an apostle and the one who is a servant to the apostle. One now that assists and is joined with Paul in this labor, this fellow labor. But he's called here a, a, a child. And the reason why it's not son, even though obviously Titus is masculine, but he uses the word child to emphasize this family responsibility according to, and here's what I said earlier, this, this common faith. Now, it's not common meaning it is uh, insignificant. There's, I mean, you see it all over. The reason why common is used here is that it is that which is relevant for all human beings. If someone's going to have faith, there's only one type, only one kind of true faith. So Titus here, or Titus, is this, 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 I believe most English translations will say true son, and he's meaning that in the spiritual sense, according to the common faith, and then notice what he says about this common faith. Next two words, grace and mercy. We cannot overemphasize the significance of these two words for our new covenant faith. This faith that Jeremiah speaks about, that, that brings about eternal forgiveness. That God will never remember our sins. That he has cast them away from his presence and his knowledge. He's able to do that. So this faith, and he says of grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, or God the Father, and, and here's what's important, the Lord, Messiah Yeshua, and then it says, our Savior. Now, here we see something. We see undeniably that our Savior at the end of verse 4 is referring to Messiah Yeshua. And therefore, that is how we know, going back to verse, verse 3 at the end, where it says, of God, our Savior. It speaks about here the divinity of Messiah. It refers to Messiah as God. He's our Savior, but he's also God. And that's why when you understand the biblical language, and you pay attention to all the scriptural indicators from grammar. You can make statements. Because I can look at this and say, undeniably, it is beyond any argument. When we pay attention to the Greek, we see here that Paul, this is scripture, is saying that our God and Savior is Messiah. And it speaks about his divinity. Now let's move on to verse 5. Verse 5, we see a purpose that Paul gave to Titus. He says, this on account. Now we wouldn't say that in English, would we? We would say, on account of this, and we'll find out what this is in a moment. But in Greek, the language, the order is flipped. And the reason for that is to show emphasis. He's wanting to emphasize this, not for the sake, but this. It was this purpose that, that motivated him to do something. And what was that? Look again at verse 5. We'll translate it how it normally sounds in English. On account of this, I left you in Crete, so Paul commanded Titus to remain. He left him in Creek and order the things. And it literally means the remaining things, meaning 
those things that have not been completed. We might be better able to understand it by the term, those things which are lacking, those things that, that are not as they should be. And that's why the next word in the text has to do with putting things in order. So those things that remain, those things that are lacking, those things that are not as they should be, that Titus would put them in order. And how would he do this? By appointing, says, and that you shall appoint katapolin, each city, according to the city, meaning each city elders. So there needs to be in every city, this is biblical, every city elders that represent the the believing community meaning they are over and we'll talk about this word over in a moment they have an authority now this does not negate what some would call the priesthood of all believers that we are individually responsible to god we are individually called to study and come to conclusions but nevertheless there is authority and one of the big things in this first chapter of titus is authority paul is going to speak strongly against those who do not demonstrate a submissiveness to authority for on account of this, I left you in Crete in order the lacking things, those things that lack, that you, would, would, you should put in order and appoint in every city elders as I to you have directed. And this is commanded. So Paul is saying here, I have set you there for the purpose of specifically entrusting elders in every city and what was the reason for this well keep reading verse 6 and now he's going to be talking about these elders who they are notice it says for if and it is in the masculine if anyone is blameless now he's going to be dealing with some of the the characteristics the qualification for an elder for if there is one who is blameless, a one woman man. Now, some, and I would be in this category, would say that an overseer, one who's going to be an elder, needs to be a man who has never been divorced, married to one woman. Others take different approaches to that and, and understand one woman man in a different sense. The purpose here is not to uh, go into a great discussion of that, other than it says, a one woman man, children, having faithful, meaning having faithful children, and not, and here it is, among a accusation of, and this word means improper, immoral, unethical living. What he says is this, an elder, a leader, an overseer, and I'll come to that word in a second, should not be one that is, is easily accused of improper behavior, doing that which is offensive to God, that which is immoral, unethical, that which is not in submissiveness to the instructions of God, the commandments of God, and the character of of, of our God and our Savior. So we shouldn't be that way, that elder or overseer, or look at the end of verse, verse 6, or, and this is a word for insubordinate. This is what I was speaking about when it talks about one who is, is not recognizing authority. As believers, we need to recognize authority godly authority and secular authority and if this this authority that's secular does not ask us to do something that is in conflict with obedience to the word of god we should submit to that for example if there's a rule saying that that you cannot uh, park your car 
in your driveway overnight? Well, the Bible doesn't demand that we, we do it. So if we're not supposed to, don't be contrary. Be submissive. Recognize that authority. It's not a biblical issue. But if some secular authority says you can't have a group over to your home to study God's word, well, that means we would have to rebel against that because we are always the supreme authority is God, what we are commanded to do in his word. But here it's a general statement that we should be submissive to authority, not insubordinate, but, but humble ourselves. Now look at verse 7. For it's necessary, and now we have the word for an overseer. I realize that some English Bibles translates this as a bishop, but a bishop is simply one who oversees a congregation or a series of congregations and such. So he tells us it is necessary, and this is a strong word. It means whenever this word, day, delta, epsilon, iota, appears in the text, it speaks about something that is absolutely necessary. It must happen. It is God's will, and it cannot be, cannot be changed. So he says, for it is necessary that the overseer, that he, and this is the second time we see this word, be blameless, to be blameless as a steward of God, an agent of God, someone that, that is employed under God's authority, that he should not be egotistical, that is self-given to his will, that he should not be one that is ruled by anger, and this has in the prefix the word for, for wrath meaning he should not be one that is given over to wrathful bursts of anger, nor, it says, literally, near wine. Now, some will say not given to much wine, but it literally says not near wine, nor, and this is a brawler. It means that he shouldn't be one that settles things by, by physical means that he is easily angered and, and brought into a physical confrontation. That is not fitting for an overseer. It says also that he should, should not be, and this word means uh, greedy, one that is, is strongly seeking gain. I think this is a very important characteristic. That he is not motivated, and we use the word grain, but another one could be the word for profit. We're not seeking some financial gain. We're not motivated in our decisions, our behavior by, by financial profit. That is not something that influences. That is not something when you look at that individual that you say, ah, he likes the finer things of life. He, he is motivated by achieving, experiencing these things. Verse 8. But what is he? Now, the word is literally a lover of strangers. And most understand this in an idiom, which means that he's hospitable. And hospitality oftentimes had to do with entertaining strangers. Let me say it another way entertaining foreigners and that's why the believing community those who are trying to get away from from difficulties in their own country those who are suffering persecution oftentimes because of some tribe they belong to some people group that they are part of and such we see this rampantly in in places like africa we should be individuals that love these strangers and want to practice hospitality to them. Now, there are, are limits. You can't simply invite hundreds of people. You may only be able to help out one or two. 
And the same thing for a government. The government cannot open up its borders to an onslaught of just a limitless supply and, and numbers without end of refugees. But there should be that, that desire to help out, to love them, to practice hospitality. So it says, an overseer, and this is part of the congregation of the Lord, an overseer should be a lover of strangers, a lover of good, meaning committed to God's will, one that is sober-minded, that is that he's stable in his thought process. And this aspect of sober means he makes decisions rooted, founded upon the truth, that he's righteous, that he is pious, meaning this, that he's not casual with spiritual things that he is rather deeply concerned about spirituality, about religious truth, about dogma, and how he and others apply that to their life. So this word is important. And then secondly, or finally, it says in, in verse, verse 8, that this one is self-control. That's one of the fruits, the outcome of the Holy Spirit. That we can control ourselves, meaning what? Overcoming temptation. That we are not easily defeated by the, the schemes, the strategy of the enemy. Verse 9. We, we seek this one, an overseer. Overseer should be one who seeks. And this holds on to, holds uh, according to the teaching of the, the faithful word. Now, this speaks about the word is faithful and that we should hold fast to that. And here again, all these things stem out of what we're reading in verse 9, that they hold fast to the overseer, that leader, that elder, is going to hold on to the doctrine of the faithful word in order that he is able also to encourage, and notice where first and foremost this encouragement is, encouraging in sound teaching. It's foundational. And that's why it's so important to be part of a fellowship where the overseer, the leader, is committed to sound doctrine. And if one is not using the proper methodology for interpreting the scripture, understanding it, then there's not going to be sound doctrine. And the problem is too many people are way too casual about, about the biblical text. And therefore we see why this passage is so relevant today. That the overseer, first and foremost, he is one who's going to hold fast to, be committed to, what does he say? To encouraging the teaching of sound doctrine. And not only encourage sound doctrine, but notice something else. Also, the ones who are contradictive, those who are speaking things contrary to sound doctrine, what must this one do? He must convict reprove bring reproach upon them and that's why it's so important that at times we name names we say there's certain individuals that are dangerous that when we look at how they handle the word of god and their consistency to profit financial gain we need to warn others and simply say such people are shysters. They are not individuals that are appropriate to oversee anything that is related to the work of God. And in the last days, as there's increase in false prophets, that's what the word of God says, Messiah told of that, we are seeing an emphasis on prophecy today. Not biblical prophecy, but prophets. I hear all the time, oh, I was so pleased to be in the presence of, of a prophet, whoever. 
and and I was at this meeting and prophet such and such was speaking well I don't recall that one in the Bible calls themselves a prophet rather what we find is this we find that God appointed them to prophesy to give prophetic truth you know we call Jeremiah the prophet Isaiah the prophet but I don't believe that Isaiah had a business card that said, Isaiah, prophet. No, they were bond servants. They were individuals that did not emphasize their, their, their position, but their labor to be faithful and in laboring into the purposes of God. So we need to be people, if you're leaders, you need to be people willing to confront, reprove those who speak contrary to the truth of Scripture. And that is desperately needed today for people to say, I'm sorry, but what you're teaching, what you're presenting, it is false. It needs to be said. Now, we can say it in love, and we'll see the motivation is to bring people back to the soundness of biblical faith. We'll come to that in a moment but look now to verse verse 10 and talking about those who need to be reproved because they're in contradiction with the word of god notice what he says in verse 10 paul speaking he says for there are many and then he uses this conjunction chi to emphasize even even and he's speaking about those who are unruly and by the way this is the same word that we saw towards the end of verse 6 where i translated those who are insubordinate those who reject authority and you know why they reject authority because authority is calling them out they don't want to submit to the truth because the truth isn't accomplishing their purposes and it won't the truth of God accomplishes God's purposes, which we're supposed to submit to. And as we grow and mature, God's purposes will be the most pleasing things of our life. But that's what maturity is about. For there are many, meaning speaking against sound doctrine, and these are unruly. They are empty talkers. And what does that mean? It means those who speak that has nothing of an eternal significance. Now, I'm going to just digress for a moment by going back to Sefer Kohelet, that is the book of Ecclesiastes. See, one of the things that, that King Solomon desired was something that was eternally significant, something that lasts, not something that was vain futile here today gone tomorrow and this is these empty talkers if you listen to them they are not teaching you anything that has kingdom implications to it so they're empty talkers and they are deceitful ones and then we have one particular group that that burdened paul he says especially those from the circumcision and what's he talking about? He's making reference to the Judaizers. Those who said, faith in Messiah is fine if you, if you for the purpose of salvation, kingdom life, also take upon yourself the yoke of the Torah. And first and foremost, the sign of that was circumcision. They were teaching without circumcision, meaning unless you make yourself a debtor of the law, you will not be saved. Paul is in, in strong opposition to this. And therefore, over and over, Paul would, when he could, he would drop references to these individuals, calling them the circumcision because they demanded all men be circumcised in order to be saved. Now, Paul wasn't against circumcision. He was against circumcision for the sake of being saved, not being saved unless you were circumcised first. So he says, especially those from the circumcision, which it is necessary, and notice what he says, to silent. And the important thing is Paul saying they need to be silent. Who? 
entire households they have, and it's hard to know how to translate this word. This is one of the words that, that has many connotations to it. Talks about corruption, talks about overturning something, and that can mean bringing destruction. These individuals brought destructions into entire households, for they were teaching what it is not necessary. This is important. They were teaching, it's that same word for that which must be, they were teaching the things which were necessary not to be teaching. I wonder today how many people that you, you hear on the radio or on television, those who have the most popular books in, in the believing community, I wonder how many of them Paul would say, it is necessary not to read them. They don't have anything that's necessary within them. And what's the outcome? The next word, and it's awkward to translate it, but he's saying here that they are teaching that which is unnecessary and it is going to bring about shame. It's, it's going to show the, the baseness. And what does that mean? How carnal. We are sinful beings. And the pursuit of these things which ought not to be taught, those things which are unnecessary for spirituality to be pleasing to God and have a God-pleasing testimony, when they're taught, it's going to bring out that base, that base which is a sinful origin. It's going to show the sinfulness, and that brings about shame. And once again, what's, what is the tool that the enemy uses to, to get people to teach what they ought not? Right here, it says, kerdus, which is gain, profit, for the sake of. It's that same unusual order because it wants to emphasize their desire of profit, their desire to have worldly gain. And that's what makes them easily being manipulated by the enemy. Verse, verse 12, Paul says, a certain one from them said, and then he wants to tell us who this certain one is, one of their own prophets. And they even rightly said, and remember where, where Titus is left, in Crete. It says, Cretes always are, are liars. They are evil beasts. And this goes back to that, that base condition of, of following animalistic instinct rather than truth. So he says they're evil beasts. When you follow that animalistic instinct, when you do what seems right in your own eyes, you're going to be doing that which is evil, that which is contrary to the will of God. And then he has the word gastrous, and in, in Greek it's a word for gluttony. So they are people driven by their own hungers, their own desires, their gluttonous, and they are lazy. Now, he's saying here that, that one of their own prophets said this about the Cretes. And then he goes on, look at verse 13. He says, this testimony is true, on account of which there is now, and he uses the word for, a case. And this is, uh, another word might be a, a, a predicate. There is now a base for what? He says, based upon this true testimony, that they are liars, they are evil beasts, they are gluttonous and lazy. Because this is true, there is a predicate. There is a basis for, what does he say? Reproving them, rebuking them them and doing so look at the the near the end of verse 13 doing so behumrah that's what it would say in hebrew do it so sternly or harshly now i like this because paul is telling us something it is acceptable to be very harsh with those who are embracing and teaching falsehood who are motivated by financial gain, who are, are in bondage to their carnal nature. 
These people, it's necessary to rebuke them harshly. Why so? Look at the end of verse 13. In order that soundness should be in the faith. So we need to always be people who are highly concerned for the soundness of doctrine, our faith. And here Paul is saying, the leaders, you need to be willing to rebuke, reproof, convict those who, who are not teaching the truth of God. Verse, verse 14. And not giving heed, this means being committed to, not being committed to, what does he say? Jewish fables. Now, when I think of Jewish fables, I think of so much of the oral law. All of these stories, these, these legends, we should not be giving heed to these things or. And what comes with these legends, these myths, these stories that, that, that fill the rabbinical literature? I'll tell you what comes with it. The commandments of men. The, the Masoret Hazkanim, the traditions of the elders. So he's saying, don't let these myths, these legends that are part of the oral law, don't let them deceive you in embracing the commandments of man. Because when you do so, and I want us to look carefully at this next phrase. It is in the, the perfect condition, and it's also passive. And what that means is this. He's speaking about something that has had this outcome in the past, it has this outcome in the present, and it has this outcome or will have in the future. When you embrace these Jewish stories, when you take hold of the commandments of man, that is going to, and notice this next word is in the passive. It means something is causing them to turn away. What's causing them to turn away? These Jewish myths and these commandments of men. It causes them to turn away from what? From the truth. Verse 15. Now, we're coming to the end, and I want us to learn a principle. He's going to share with us a very important principle. Let's just read what he says, and then we're going to discuss it. Verse, verse 15. He uses a condition, mende. What is mende? It's two different words, two conjunctions. And when they're used in one, one phrase, it speaks about on one hand this, but on the other hand that. So we could translate it. On one hand, everything is clean to the ones who are clean. But to the ones who have been defiled, it says, and faithless, nothing is clean. Now, what does he mean? Well, what he's saying here is this. If I am clean, meaning committed to the things of God. Remember the last thing that he said at the end of the other verse, previous verse? Truth. When I'm committed to the truth, all things I can utilize for the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean when he says all things are clean, meaning you can do whatever sinful thing you want, it's okay. That's ridiculous. What he's saying here is this, that anything can be used by one who is clean, committed to the truth. He knows how to be a steward of that. He knows how to utilize that, how to deal with that for the purposes of God. But those who are unclean, those who are not committed to the truth of God, all things for them, no matter what it is, even if it's something that's truly clean, They'll misappropriate it. They'll use it for a wrong purpose. So nothing for those who have been made unclean. That's what it literally says here. And this is a past condition, a present, and will continue to be a condition. And that causes them to be unfaithful. And for them, nothing is clean. Then he says, but... Those that are, are unclean or those who are, and the idea here is those who have been defiled, but those who have been defiled, 
also their minds, also their conscience. Meaning, they, they have been defiled by embracing that which is untrue, turning over to those things which are in conflict with the purposes of God. And that brings about a defilement that affects the way we think and also the very conscience. Meaning that which God gave to us, and I shared with you before, that the Hebrew, this is Greek, but in Hebrew, the word for conscience is related to the word for compass. One is matzpen and the other one it's matzpun. So very similarly, the conscience is the compass that God gives to us. But when we reject the truth, when we begin to live in defilement, that is committed to the things we ought not be, it's going to cause us to think wrong and it's going to cause the conscience not to work. Verse 16. And hear how this manifests itself in a practical sense. Such people, it says, they, they confess, they know God, but here's the problem. But in contrast to that, that's that conjunction of contrast, but in contrast to that, the, the works, meaning the works of one who knows God, the works of the truth, what did they do? They deny. And they become, and this next word means, well, the best way to understand it is they become gross. They become that which is, is so unappealing. That which is rejectable, rejectable. We don't want anything to do with, with their behavior, their teaching. We see it as just uh, a reproach. So they become gross and, and notice this, they become disobedient. What's that word for disobedient? Against the faith. That's literally what it is. They become against the faith and also against every good work, against every good work. Now, the last word here comes from, we get the English word to document something by it. Oftentimes you want proof and they give you a guarantee. It's a document and it's for attesting to something. And those of faith, what he's saying here is those of faith will document what is a good work what is pleasing to God, what is related to the will of God. That's what faith produces. But those who are disobedient, that do not have faith, what are they going to do? They are not going to document. They are going to be against giving any evidence that this is a good work. They are going to be opposed to that which is related to the will of God. So when we look at this first chapter of Titus, we see that Paul is encouraging this young man, one that Paul loves, one that he sees as a true child of his because of a shared faith, a shared commitment to the will of God. And he tells this young man, I'm leaving you there in Crete. And it wasn't an easy place to be. We saw that it's a place full of liars, people who are far removed from the instruction of God. And what did he tell this young man to do? He says, you need to fight, contend for sound doctrine, right teaching, teaching that is related to the truth of God. And when you encounter that which is not sound, that which is not related to the truth, you need to speak out against it harshly, severely. And that is what? we are all called to do if we fail to do this we're going to see more and we began with this term apostasy and i'm going to conclude with it we'll see greater apostasy coming into the congregation of believers yes god says it's going to happen but that does not mean that we ought not stand against it be people who speak out and who rebuke those who speak based upon personal gain and those who reject that which is a good thing in order to further their ungodliness. Well, we'll close with that until our next lesson, Titus chapter 2, as we continue our conference.
in this book of Titus. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.